Should we just start with all of us trying to say Heineken Rivalry Week? Just go one, <laughs> two, three, four. And Heineken Rivalry Week. Heineken Rivalry Week. Heineken it's hard. You have to be very intentional. You have to slow rivalry. it down. Heineken and Week, week. easy. Yeah. Heineken Rivalry Week, Sue, hard. Suze crushes it because she was an actress, so she did all that like voice training and enunciation. How now, brown cow? Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Oh, from New York, New York, you are listening to Extra Time, driven by Continental from the AT&T MLS Studios in Midtown Manhattan. I am Andrew Weeby. With me, my partners in soccer, the squad, Matt Doyle, David Goss, Bobby Warshaw. It has been too long, guys. I feel like I'm back in 2018. I'm comfortable. I'm loose. I'm not even tired. Not after Heineken Rivalry Week. Not after five days in the studio until 3 a.m. every single night. I feel great. Did you realize that Bobby was lip syncing your Intro? I didn't. I felt like he was more, yeah, I noticed it, but I kind of tried to ignore it because it was throwing me off, and now he's staring holes at Bobby, me with like a really kind of s- like saccharine sweet look in his eyes. On the way to the uh, show today, uh, Bobby's like, you know my favorite hit that Weeby does is Welcome to New York. I hope he opens with it. Oh. And I was like, I think there's a good chance yeah. he opens with mm-hmm. it. I'm I surprised he didn't wear this. the t-shirt, the Andrew <laughs> Weeby live from New York, New York t-shirt. Mm, it's O from New York. O from New, New York. York. Yeah, yeah, I on. never come listened on. to that is, song really? anyway. Okay. I think right. the O is what sucks Bobby. Yeah. <laughs> the O is, of course, the throwback to Nick Furshaw, but we won't get into that. We've got a big show coming up here. Robin Frazier, you know him as assistant coach for Toronto FC. No. No, you don't? You now Not know anymore. him. Nope. Now you know him as the head coach for the Colorado Rapids. That was announced Some this weekend. Some of us weekend. know him as a defender for the Colorado Foxes. Oh, wow. Going APSL on us right now. How I many see Colorado that. Foxes oh, by the games way. did you watch? Not a lot. Yeah, okay. no. <laughs> Anybody who listens to this show for any long period of time knows that about Robin Frazier. We've chatted with him before, but this time, some new circumstances. We're going to have him on the show very, very soon. Um, Heineken Rivalry Week, we'll talk about that. We also have an Open Cup final coming up on Tuesday in Atlanta. Atlanta and Minnesota United trying to get the first trophy of the year. I know Supporters Shield, basically LAFC own that, but it's not official Excuse just me? yet. Wow. Sorry, what did you oh, say? Oh, my God. I forgot the Campeones Cup. Oh, oh God. boy. Oh. Oh, demerits for me. I'm going to be getting a call. They defeated <laughs> the Campiones de Campiones in the Campiones Cup to right. become Campiones of the Campiones I know. Cup. Look, you know how big of a League's Cup and Campiones Cup guy I am, so this is personally shameful, <laughs> and I want to go high. Maybe if you had gotten that Heineken Rivalry Week boot, you would have remembered. That's true. I'm still waiting for my boot. I have a feeling I'm never going to get it. Tuesday, 8 p.m. Eastern, ESPN Plus, <laughs> U.S. Open Cup Final, Atlanta United, Minnesota United. And we have the mailbag. Any teas from the mailbag here, Dave? Yeah, Good we got stuff. great stuff. It's going to be center back heavy mailbag. So getting a little love All right, on the back line. So, Bobby, control yourself until then. <laughs> El Trafico. That's where we'll start with Heineken Rivalry Week, because where else would you start at this point? 3-3 draw at Bank of California Stadium. Downtown L.A. was popping. So was uh, Zlatan Ibrahimovic, because that's what he does in this game. Eight goals and six traficos. Excuse me, five traficos. One less than. I mean, that's incredible. He throws out the Megan Rapino. Yeah, that was tight. That was that was pretty sweet. I think he did it twice in front of the thirty-two fifty-two. Well, the second one was more of just like a "I am here." Gotcha. Moment. Mm, gotcha. Yeah. So look, nice. they were up three-one, and Is everybody. That how you entered as well? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's how I walk really? into the Bank of California Stadium every time. <laughs> you were there, Dave. I was there. You witnessed this. You yeah. saw the Galaxy go up 3-1, and everybody, including ourselves, go, uh-oh, the shoe dropped for LASC again, and then they, they just clawed back. Couldn't quite get it done, and it's still there. They still have not beat the Galaxy. Still have not won El Trafico. It is delicious for people that sit on a desk and talk about Major League Soccer for five days or seven days a week, depending on you're what right about that. schedule. Oh, you're <laughs> right about that. That billboards, the billboards being defaced, Latif yeah. Blessing saying his friends was were ribbing yeah. him about the billboards. I mean, all of it, just like, I just, I love it. Uh, because, um, and uh, John Thornton worded it to me last week with, he called it games of consequence, big games, right? And he said when he played in MLS, you just didn't have them a lot of times in the regular season. Now you feel it in this rivalry. You feel it in other big games. And for LAFC, they're in that spot where it's like, yep, you are 100% the best team in the regular season. Can you do it in the playoffs? They can't prove that till they get to the playoffs. But there are these big games where you can gear it up like a playoff atmosphere and say, here's a little test case for us of how they're going to play. And they played awful in the first 25 minutes of this game. And they did things to me that were uncharacteristic for them. The biggest one was just giving away lazy passes at times. Not aggressive passes that were picked off. Just bad passes from Atuesta, Blessing, and Kay that you just don't see. They looked rattled. They looked uncomfortable in their own building. And they recovered, which is big for them. 
and they recovered with an expectation, I think, even down 3-1, that they were going to win that game. And you saw that on the way they reacted after the game, which was, it was a loss to them. Uh, it's what they said to us. Everyone's seen the picture of Latif Blessing sitting on the ground. Um, Mark Anthony K was despondent, off on his own. Walker Zimmerman talked to me and just, it was like he had lost a championship yeah, it was like game. A, it was a eulogy. Yeah. So right now, LAFC, there is a question mark around them, how they will perform in these big games. And we won't have an answer to that till the playoffs. Um, and that, to me, is probably the most fascinating thing that came out of it. So that's the on-field side. Before I let you two dive in, and I know that we will get there, I, I want the like in-stadium experience because Heineken Rivalry Week had so many awesome sort of occasions and comings together of two fan bases. And this one, people will say, hey, it's new. Don't put it at the top. But it's hard not to because every game delivers, because the stadiums are just roiling, yeah. because both fan bases seem to clearly dislike each other in a real way. And now the teams do, too. I mean, if this felt like one of those games that if you like soccer, no matter where you live, forget like anywhere on this globe, this is a game you'd want to be at. Well, so the, it starts with the tailgate. It's one of the best tailgates in MLS. It's across the street. So if you ever go to a game, it started at noon local time. The game kicked off at 740. These people tailgated for seven hours. Nice. Doyle's over here like, get sick from watching too much MLS. But thanks again. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, was at, I was at 16A back in the day. Just uh, yeah, say. That, uh, back uh, in the old days. MLS was different back then. I just want to say. And it, it's a great vibe. I rec obviously recommend every, everyone go to a game. I went to the San Jose Earthquakes game at LAFC last week. And it's similar, especially with the supporter section. They pack two hours before the game every single game. And it is, you've never seen anything like this. 4,000 fans just moving in unison for 90 minutes, singing the chants, the, the arm movements, swaying back and forth, but in pure unison and just like energy and noise the entire time. And then you get into this one and the entire crowd's with them, right? So last Wednesday, it's a smaller crowd, not as engaged. The entire stadium's with them, except one LA Galaxy section who's swaying to their own songs. And so you just had this like, pure energy and atmosphere to it. And even after Zlatan's goal, it didn't go away. And then you can say that about a lot of rivalry games, but I'm standing there watching the game and Matt Leinert's standing next to me. It's LA. Like there's just moments. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar walks out and throws the Falcon. There's something different about yeah. LA at times. <laughs> Kevin so it has, Costner's there. I mean, yeah. So it has the energy and vibe of like a true gritty soccer game with the glitz and glamour of LA uh, added into it. And then just the quality on the field. I mean, I'm standing 10 feet away from Pavone and Vela matching up against each other. These were two of the best players at the World Cup a year ago. It's special. It was unique. Um, I was worried because they've all been good. And it's like, well, now I'm going to go to one, and it's going to be a dud. It's going to be a 1-0 game. It's going to be four. And four seconds in, it's like, oh, no, no, no. I nailed it. I picked it right. <laughs> four seconds in, Christian Pavone goes on a marauding run. Oh, just, what a goal. Just throws LAFC behind him, slips through Zlatan, goal. Here comes the Rapino. Beautiful finish. This start for LA Galaxy. This was the start that you kind of expected they might have because for all the sort of, and I don't think it's mediocrity, but sort of just like meh play that they have, and games not against LAFC, when they get to LAFC, you can understand why maybe they might go for six. The race to six might actually happen because get this team in a single elimination game and anything can happen. Anything. Yeah, on talent, I mean, if they're not the best in the league, they're second or, or third at, at the lowest. I mean, you, you might look at that roster, especially Pavone, and say, on talent, the Galaxy have more than... LAFC, but it wasn't about talent for the first 20 minutes. And, and I, I just tweeted this out. The first 20 minutes of this game was a classic. We're going to come out. We're going to punch him in the mouth. We're going to control the game. We're going to overwhelm them with our intensity and our physicality. And we see this all the time. And it's like, you got to make those 20 minutes count. You have to get a multi-goal lead. You have to just end the game because you cannot keep that up over the course of 90 minutes. And we saw it with the Red Bulls against NYCFC because that's what they tried to do against NYCFC. By minute 15, 18, somewhere, the Red Bulls had to drop their line. They just weren't able to keep that up. Same thing happens to the Galaxy. First 20 minutes, they like I keep track of duels. The Galaxy were dominating LAFC. They had won 28 of the 42 duels. They had won 66% of the duels, which you never see. Mark Anthony Kay, on that first goal, blessing and Atuesa, just getting blown up by Pavone. These are the, the physical moments in soccer that matter. You don't get that goal from Zlatan. You don't get that second goal from, from Pavone, uh, or third goal, rather, from Pavone, if they're not winning those duels in central midfield. And they did that, and they got the multi-goal lead. 
and LAFC should have died. And from the rest, like from minute 20 onwards, LAFC just beat the hell out of them. LAFC just beat the ever-loving hell out of them to the point at the end of the game, LAFC won 53 duels, the Galaxy won 52. They came back into the game once Atuesta, K, and Blessing came out of the locker room, so to speak, and realized that if they weren't like if they were going to let Dos Santos and Legette uh, and Alvarez keep blowing them up in midfield, then then like it was just going to be a humiliation. It was all about that. Like Zlatan's amazing, Vela's amazing. You know all the other stuff that we saw from the wingers. It was all fun. It was all good. It was about that central midfield, and the Galaxy just killed them for the first twenty. Yeah, it was incredible to watch, wasn't it? How poor LAFC were. And I was. I, I just want to say I was worried for Mark Anthony K because this would have been the second game in a row where you're like, oh man, he's just not up. Well, for it. it almost in a certain way it showed that they. All Aren't, I don't want to say that how much they lack talent, right? A lot of people say LAFC are just so much better than everyone else. That first 20 minutes, you're like, no, they're not, right? Mark Anthony K could not cope. Latif Blessing could not cope. Edward, Edward Atuesta showed why he's just a 22-year-old. They were totally overwhelmed. You talk about the differences in qualities of play. The first thing players always pay, say is the speed of play. That was one of those examples. That's why it's so hard to judge players moving up levels because you just never know how they're going to cope with the speed of play. And pretty much, what was it four meetings so far? that this team has had against the Galaxy, I guess the one this year and the one last year where they they lost, they could not step up to it. It really took 20 minutes for those three to be able to deal with the speed of play, but my God, when they did, oh my how God. good is this team? <laughs> like it, was, it, was, it was almost like we saw those three players take a step up in their careers right in front of us around that 20th minute mark where they could deal with the pressure, they could make sense of the game, and Bob loves the line, we had to find the football, right? All teams that play the that play LAFC, their first goal is to destroy whatever LAFC want to do. You then have to make peace with that chaos and get, get the, if, if soccer is largely how fast like, can you process prim images in your brain? You have to start to process those images faster. If you can do that and you can see the pictures in your head to make sense of what's going on, to then instill your ideas and your way of playing into the chaos, into those faster images, you will win. And LAFC figured that out. And if that wasn't the last hurdle for them, I, I don't know what was. I mean, the last hurdle would yeah. have been getting that fourth goal. Exactly. But like coming out of this, I, I, like I'm seeing a lot of Galaxy fans talking and like it's understandable because they have yet to lose to LAFC mm -hmm. um, and they have Zlatan who's a, a match winner all on his own and Pavone apparently can maybe be a match winner all on his own but if I was a Galaxy fan I would be terrified of meeting LAFC in the playoffs because Blessing, Atuesta, and Kay know how to do it now. They know how to, like, this This was it. And, like, if if Vela doesn't come off injured at the 60th minute, this one ends 5-3. I was going to say, by the way, they're going to baby that hamstring yeah. and make sure that he is there for the playoffs. I don't know if he was feeling it the whole game, though, because he wasn't himself the entire game. Before we get to Carlos Vela, can I add one more soccer part mm -hmm. from this on what LAFC did to adjust and why Bob Bradley is still ahead of everyone else? The number one thing that the Galaxy did tactically was compact their lines horizontally. When, when we think about how LAFC score on teams, the picture comes to your mind. Carlos Vela and Diego Rossi splitting the outside back and the center back. It happens a million times a season. The Galaxy were so tight horizontally. So what happened around that 35-40 minute mark? Carlos Vela and Diego Rossi started to hold their run. So now Mark Anthony K picks up his head. Instead of trying to split, what does he do? He just plays it outside. This is how they got that third goal. They did it a few times to Diego Rossi. So it wasn't just the fact that they figured it out. There was also thinking going on throughout the game. A little detail again that separates this team. How many teams in the 35th minute would have figured that out and adjusted? Okay, on a deal. No, I agree with you. And yeah. also, and then you look at Kay's space to now dribble a little bit inside, which changed after mm -hmm. Rossi started to find that because it was Rossi down the left side, yeah. pulling Felcher, and then that shifts that entire back line. He had one play where he came down the right wing and Megda player cut back and lays the ball off, and I just turned to someone and I was like, I hate Canada right now. <laughs> I want this player so bad. He's so much fun to watch. I just want to say that he also got put under by Pavone in this game, too. He did? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, that was part of the fun, right? Because yeah. yeah. these guys were going yeah, back, back and, and forth. forth. And but again, by the 35th, 40th minute, it was it was one-way traffic. It was. And Leggett even said it after the game. He's like, they dominated us in the second half. It, it could have gotten ugly for the Galaxy. But that, that could but, have is going to rank but, Bob Bradley, no? Maybe, but to Bobby's point, he also sounded okay with it. He said, we should have won this game. They dominated us. And going into LAFC, because everyone's going to have to go there in the playoffs, that's the mentality you need. We've seen Portland do it. And LAFC mentioned this week, they're our rivals on the field. That's the team we're worried most about. And the Galaxy seemed comfortable with the concept of, 
we're just going to go there and do whatever we have to do because we have match winners and we can score goals, which going forward is what they need in that potential playoff. Let's talk Carlos Vela. You said he wasn't at his best, you didn't think, for the entirety of this match. There were a couple moments that I would have expected him to finish in a different way. He did get his goal, got up to 27 on the season. That would, in seasons past, tie the all-time record for single-season goals. Of course, it doesn't anymore. That's 31 for uh, my guy Joseph Martinez. But was it the right decision for Bob Bradley to take out Vela? Because anybody who watched that broadcast, anybody who um, reads lips or you know follows the LA Galaxy who are having a lot of fun with that little clip of Carlos Vela being upset, being taken off. Thoughts? You were there? Gotta Maybe do you. It. Yeah, yeah, it's the right yeah. decision. No brainer. Yeah, the key is to win MLS Cup. Yeah, and they hope they get the Galaxy in the playoffs on the way so that they can finally beat them. But if they win Sporter Shield and MLS Cup. It doesn't matter what happened in that game. The key was to keep him healthy. You could have a question mark why he played 90 against San Jose on Wednesday, um, which I thought was fascinating when it happened. Um, That would probably be my main one. And then maybe something about the communication of it happening. Apparently, Eddie Segura came over. He was kind of thrown off by it, and it clearly affected the team for a minute or two, although Brian Rodriguez came on and played well. I don't know the behind that, how much you're going to communicate to the players. Like, he's hurt. Um, I, you just have to trust your, trust your coaching staff, but it was the right move. And to Vela's credit, one, he got really pissed off when it happened, which you see all of Mexican media right now being like, is he passionate about soccer? <laughs> and then two, he went off and he got wrapped and he sat with the trainer over in the corner. And then Jonah Dos Santos got hurt like a few moments later and he got off the bench and went into their huddle and was talking with Brian Rodriguez and giving him pointers yeah. and talking with Diego Rossi. And so with the... Everyone's going to, I don't know how anyone could talk about throwing a physical armband. That's an obscene conversation to even have. But that's what you wanted to see from him, right? Is he wanted to be in the game. And when he couldn't, he did everything he could to help his team win. So uh, before we get out of here, I have this thought about Zlatan. And, uh, you know, the show is over. Wow. Yeah, it's done. It's done. We're just going to talk about Zlatan for the next 40 minutes. (laughs) Robin Frazier, that interview, it's gone. We can't do it. We'll save it for another time. Zlatan hates the playoff format. But it occurs to me that the playoff format is literally the only reason that the Galaxy will win any silverware this year. If it was two legs, I just, would not trust this com- at all. Did you just predict the Galaxy will win MLS? No, Cup? I said if they're you going said, to win anything, if they that's win That's not anything, what you said. No, nah, uh, I'm pretty sure I have to okay, uh, all right, right. go listen back to well, that. Gotta, we got to use VAR on that. Yeah. I, this is the only way they're going to win anything is one game, Zlatan, Pavone, and hanging on because good teams create chances against them. Good teams can figure them out over the course of 90 minutes. Am I wrong? You're all silent? How many good teams are there? That's a good that's, question. I mean, that's actually that's, even better that's question. That's the question that I, I have right now. I mean, I, I think San Jose are, are very, very good, but they're limited um, by their talent, frankly, compared to these two teams. And uh, I, I, still, I still think that you can game plan your way out of uh, a beating against man marking. Um, Although it will be tough for the Galaxy because Laton – isn't going to move. Like, he's always yeah, going to stay. Yeah, that's fair. So that kind of hurts them. Yeah. And then RSL's playing really well. I'm not sure that – I think against anybody – at this point, if you're the Galaxy, against anybody except LAFC, you just go in there with your chest puffed out, man. All right. Well, we'll save the conversation about second uh, best Wait, hang on one second. Yeah, what? My hand's to my ear. Don't restart. Oh, sorry. We got to check. Uh, we are getting confirmation. I'm not no. even going to review it. Uh-uh. You did say no. will win. No, that's <laughs> definitely not true. That's not true. Mm-mm. The producer producer Anders confirmed. was not listening. I know. Sorry, he we'll, we'll do this Premier League stuff for you. Uh, uh, a video review has taken place. Nice. It has been confirmed. Nice. Is that your English accent? It was. Yeah, that was. Horrible. I don't know. You should let <laughs> Bobby do these things. All right, yeah, Bobby, can you do it for me? God, let's talk. Hell is real. Keep it on Sunday. Hell is sort of real for these teams in uh, you know playoff terms because they're not going to make it. But that did not seem to matter at Nippert Stadium. Cincinnati, Columbus, it was heated. There were fights inside the net. There were big moments. The crowd was into it. Both teams were into it. Don't give me this cynical look, Doyle. It wasn't a fight. Oh, they it was a sim. Hey, but come on. It's a soccer fight. We know those are always weak. It was a Mario Matarita That fight. was, that was, yeah. Mario Matarita <laughs> actually, they like threw, they actually threw headbutts. I don't oh, think they got come on. Bro, but did not land. Matarita did. Did not land. Mario Wichita, sort of Wichita did. is soft. Yeah, yeah whatever. <laughs> Giassi got redemption. So that was good. I mean, that first goal, the ball's coming across the six. I was holding my breath. Just, you know, I, I don't have any personal stake in Giassi Zardes, but I was like, I hope he finishes this because you of do. 
We've Do talked I? about that. What is my personal stick? He was the first person you ever told that you were going to be oh, a father. Oh, I do. I That's forgot weird. about that. You guys are connected. You yeah, have an anniversary. He yeah. celebrates it every year. Oh, like yeah. This. I forgot about that. Can we talk about Jossie's first touch on that long ball? Yeah, beautiful. Because that's, like, this was a route one goal. Eloy Room had been playing it short, and this time like he just booted it upfield. And I don't know whether or not this was scripted by, by Caleb Porter and the crew because they had really explicitly played it short for the first 20 minutes, still hammering that right side, getting Harrison Awful on the overlap and just going 2v1 against Gutman because Rowan Lama will not defend. Um, or maintain possession. Or Yeah, it doesn't do much. <laughs> um, so he just booted it long, and he had Vanderwerf on his back, and he brings it down with this... Picture perfect touch, like and then like outlet and then turn and go and just leaves the the Cincinnati defense in the dust. Like that was clearly designed. And then on the second goal, Chassis scores the perfect touch in the box with his chest before thumping that home again on a cross from the right. It, it was a great game. He played a he played a great game. Granted. It was against Cincinnati. Well, they they were the exact patterns that Greg Berhalter drew up last year and has done with the national team. You play you you set up like you're going to build out. Maybe you play one or two passes. If they're high, you break lines with the ball in the air into the striker. Either he holds it up and all of a sudden you bypass seven players. If he doesn't, which is what happened on the second one. Remember we talked about this in the green room last year, and I mixed up Christian Ramirez and Jossie Zardes. Yep. In like the second, it's a it's a pattern Berhalter runs over and over saying. We want to build out from the back, but it doesn't always have to be in the ground. We can play direct and either hold it up with a striker or win the second ball. The first goal came from Jossie holding it up. The second one came from the the second ball. It's a Burhalter patent pattern. It's unclear if Caleb asked them to do it or if they just reverted back to it. But this was exactly what they did last year. And then Harrison Offal gets the ball in the Harrison Offal zone for the early whipped ball in behind. This was two of the nicest goals anyone has scored all year because it's it's clearly something they had worked on. They had rehearsed it, and it's replicable. And by the way, most crosses are terrible. M- mostly you, sh- you should not cross the ball, but early whipped balls mm-hmm. across a back line that's running at, like, you always hit that pass. You always hit that pass, especially if it's coming from a design play. That said, the third goal was kind of hilarious because at least he has, should have squared that for Jossie, but instead he punished, he punished uh, Teton for Teton diving out of the Teton also agrees that he should have squared it because yeah. he anticipated that, that one, yeah, and it was bad. Also, the, other, the, the last little piece I'll add is, uh, they started getting killed over the top as well from Giassi, and Teton doesn't come off his line. And there was too much space to cover back there. And oh, dude, Cincinnati, what? my goodness. <laughs> yeah. It's on it's like it's it's the weirdest. I mean, I understand it's a new coach trying to figure out how he wants to play and try to implement his system, but you're gonna have Kendall Waston and Vanderver pressing? Like what what are you doing? Yeah, and Gutman's getting laid out to dry right now, which is I feel bad for him. Let's Doyle just, feels uh, less bad for him. Yeah, let's let's bring it to the Reaper right now. We should probably start doing this. Let's probably eulogize oh, FC Cincinnati's yeah, yeah. season. We don't have the actual scythe. It, it might be here somewhere. It's, we'll yeah, find it's got to it. be yeah. in the prop wall. We'll wow. find it. Maybe it's producer real Anders can hook us up with that. Yeah, I mean, but uh, uh, grab a Heineken, just smash. Yeah, it. Just, just <laughs> shank. <laughs> just, just wow. That's uh, that's that's vivid. That's vivid. So eulogize it for us. FC Cincinnati in 2019. Mm. Uh, it, it was mm. the worst laid plans of mice and men. I don't know. <laughs> Anything Winks, I think. that could go wrong uh, actually did um, from roster construction to uh, tactical preparation in preseason. I mean, we heard two weeks into preseason. Oh, uh, Steve is bringing the scythe. Here we go. Uh, Steve, always the pro, doesn't yeah, get any always camera wants shot. Yeah, always wants to get that scythe we, in every we single We heard a couple of weeks into preseason that they had already changed their tactical approach and their formation uh, three times in, in two weeks. And then they changed it again three times in the last two weeks. So you get off to what was a really bad start masked by a couple of very lucky results. Um, but then the, the bottom dropped out pretty predictably and the entire rest of the year has been an exercise in, in damage mitigation uh i don't know how well they've done we we have to see what ron johns has say say that again ron yons ron yons sorry it's like ron is tired and so he wants to yawn and yeah. like ron yons we could agree that ron johns would be a great yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Mm-hmm. That, ron yons that's we, more we of have, a fish and chips fast food fast food yeah. right we, we have to see what they have and Honestly, it's it's going to be about um, better player recruitment first and foremost this off season. And unfortunately, they spent so much on guys who who have proved to not be 
centerpiece players that I'm, I'm not sure that they have that extra allocation money that, that expansion teams come in with to, to undo some of the pain that they caused themselves. And I look at that team, and, and there, are some, there are some players who've done it in MLS before, and there are some young players who are promising, but I, I, other than maybe Alan Cruz, I, I don't think I see a single guy who can be a, a truly a core player um, in, in MLS going forward. And I think that if you're going to study how not to build an expansion team for year one on the field, uh, you want to look at FC Cincinnati. I just want to add to that because I'm not going to argue and say that it was well constructed. The roster obviously was not real, well constructed, but I do feel like it's a little bit of a red herring. No, explain yourself. Sorry. No, we're just waiting for it. Yeah. What's the red herring? I, yeah. I just don't want to be in the shot when I mean, you we, say you, you believe in FC Cincinnati. No, but we <laughs> we did this with San Jose last year. We did this with New England. Who else has made a resurgence, right? Rosters matter. I'm not going to tell you rosters don't matter, but coaching matters more. And I, I care about this because it's truly like the thing, the single thing in life that makes me the most energized and passionate is the ability of coaching to lift up players. But when you look at San Jose and you look at New England, if you have the right man, like San Jose was almost equally as bad last year as Cincinnati are this year, and they added nobody, right? Maybe Christian Espinosa, and he is a very good player, so maybe I shouldn't say nobody. And Judson. But yeah, I agree with you. But Anibal, even they were winning yeah, yeah, with Anibal I agree with you. No, I agree. Right, so I'm not going to say that the roster wasn't poorly constructed and they don't need better players. I just don't think that's the number one thing on their list. All right. We'll see for FC. It is now because they yeah. presumably got their coach. And if the, yeah, he is probably we can we can acknowledge that they aren't going to win with this roster passing and pressing, which it sounds like he wants to do. Yeah. Four three three high lines, keep the ball. This roster was going to win by sitting deep, having Nick Haglin, Kendall Watson had a crap load of balls, and Darren Max and Kakuta Mane run fast. And they didn't try any of that, except for the two games they won. It has not worked out well for them. They just need to have me in the stadium for every home game, and they'll win. Right, Dave? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Give me the march. The fans have done their thing this year. Just want to say that. The TIFO was awesome. Ahead of hell is real. It was great. But uh, mark them off the list. They're not making the playoffs. We all knew that. Same thing the Vancouver Whitecaps. They allowed 5 million shots to San Jose this weekend. Mm -hmm. We'll hit this one quickly. Maxime Cropo stood on his head. Well done. San Jose, is this the resurgence? Is this it? Like, they lost three straight games, but they were road games. They were tough games. They come back home. Yeah, it's Vancouver. But did we maybe overreact to the slide and now they'll equalize? Or How much did we react to the slide? I don't know. You weren't around. You were sick. So maybe we got a little bit panicky around these parts. Did you? I, I mean, I wasn't here either. I don't think we overreacted to the slide. <laughs> What, what, did you, so what was, you what was your reaction? Yeah. yeah. Put a people, bow on it for us, Bobby. Hold on. People weren't saying, oh boy, they're regressing. Oh boy, now they're getting tired. Oh boy, all that work that Matisse sure. did. No, no, you can acknowledge they're getting tired without panic about it, right? It's the same thing that can work. I, I still have no idea how my feelings on the system in general, but it's shown that it can win trophies. You know, the fact that they lost three in a row doesn't change that. They definitely got tired. Playing at altitude didn't help them. Playing at Sporting Kansas City is always hard, especially since Sporting Kansas City is a 4-5-1 sit deep and play direct team, which is like kind of depressing and kind of weird, but it is what it is, and they've won <laughs> two in a row. Then it was at LAFC, so it was a hard three games. They play a bad Portland team at home, and they smack them. So there were reasons and 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 Wait, Portland? Vancouver? Vancouver, right, sorry. Denver, yeah. yeah, so there there were reasons at San Jose, and there's loss, and it was a little bit concerning, but I don't think we it's overplayed a, it. To toss in the LAFC one, they actually created a ton of chances, and they rotated their squad because it was midweek coming off at KC going to Vancouver. Um, so I don't actually think that was very indicative of what they were doing. I think there's still belief in that group. Uh, the question is where you had them. If you thought they were the second-best team in the Western Conference, then maybe, yeah, you're down off that. If you think they're a playoff team in the Western Conference that no one's going to want to play, then I think you're still where you're at with them, which is how I feel. They All still right. might be the second-best team in the West, by the way. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, 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 nobody, nobody has an I argument know. That conversation's it. coming. Four teams owned it over the last, like, ten days. Minnesota, RSL, Four Seattle, teams owned it this weekend. Galaxy. I mean, back. Just <laughs> Minnesota went into the weekend in second place. Se Seattle won on Friday night. They became second place. Uh, okay, so, so RSL right. won Saturday night. They became second place. Galaxy went ahead on Sunday night. They became second place. Then Galaxy tied. They dropped back. RSL. Four different teams so, were second place in the so West. So what you're week. saying is now we're having this conversation. <laughs> Who is the second best team in the West? Because RSL are up to second under Freddie Juarez. They had a big late win oh, right. against the Colorado Rapids. A couple goals in stoppage time. Really needed that one. You had the Sounders taking Cascadia Cup. Went to Portland. 1-2-1. The Timbers have now dropped two straight at home. 
Sporting Kansas City are still alive, but in being alive, they won the nicest rivalry in MLS. They knocked off Minnesota United. That had to be disappointing for Ike Opara. So who's second best? Is the Galaxy? I mean, I, I kind of threw it out there that, you know, we'll go back to video review after this show. I did not say they would win it, but they're right there. So you have at least four teams that could That'll be on make a claim. Replay, by the way. We, no, it won't. The number of second best conversations we've had this yeah, week. It's too many. Well, that's the problem. The problem is you have these conversations when it's not clear. Because nobody separates themselves, which nobody has separated themselves. Yeah, okay, who would you I'll, say? I'll do the same thing with the Western Conference I'll do with the Eastern Conference. There is no second team. There is a second tier. They were all there. They all have claimed to it. There is no second best team at the moment. Cop out. No, you can't. Maybe you want to give it to by default. Maybe you're soft and weak and get scared by Atlanta fans yelling at you on Twitter or, or Seattle <laughs> fans yelling at you on Twitter. No, just pick a team that you have no, some belief. I don't, belief. I don't okay, give it by default. Out. It's not by default. How about this? There are four teams that will lump into this conversation. If we're going to push San Jose, and well, you could bring them in. It could be five. I don't think Dallas belongs there, probably. Maybe you could I'm throw picking, the Portland I'm Timbers in Dallas. there. I'm picking Dallas. I don't know. Pick a freaking team. Uh, I say Seattle. I think when healthy – with the group of talent that they have. Why their group of talent? Why is their uh, Yeah. Why is their, you, their group of talent like the fourth best on this list? I completely disagree with you. I think their group of talent is better than Minnesota United. I think collectively it's better than the LA Galaxy. I wouldn't trust a single LA Galaxy defender 1v1 defending. Mm. Not a single one. So I would take Seattle Sounders over that. And then it just has a collective group top to bottom when healthy. The problem for them Two things. One, and by the way, the, Fry over Bingham is there's a big yes. gap there too. Uh, I don't trust Seattle to handle moments well. Basically, they were up against Portland and left the game open. I don't know why you would do that. And two, when not fully healthy, I worry about them. And then you get into the Philly conversation, which is like, oh, how great, how deep they are, but you need all eleven players to be healthy to put out your best performances, which is very unlikely to happen for every single game. All right, you say the Sounders. Who do you say? I, th- I think I say RSL. If you go back to the end of April, they're 12, 6, and 3. Um, they've played well against almost everybody except LAFC. Uh, I, I, like, I like the way they play, but it's weird because Sam Johnson, I thought, was going to be a big part of it. There's so much worse with him on the field because he only wants to run through the lines and find chances. So he makes everybody play to him. And that's what we saw this weekend against Colorado. As soon as he came off the field and Crylock went up as that sort of kind of target forward who just links and drags defenders around and creates those gaps for Savarino and Plata and Rishnak to run through, they're so much better. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how Freddy Juarez figures that out. But I, I I like this RSL team a ton. They, they've started to play fun soccer. Um, when Justin Glad plays, they're 12-3-3 three, and three with a plus 21 goal differential. When he doesn't play, they're 1-7-1-15. One, one, now, it's fragile. You need your best player or your best defender on the field, but pretty much everybody's fragile like that. You know, every, like, other than maybe LAFC, you look at all these teams in the Western Conference, they're one guy away from a crisis. You take Ike off the field, they're not a they're maybe not they're a giving up well, yeah. 70 goals yeah. again. That sound that you're hearing is Adrian Heath dialing the hot take hotline <laughs> 401 MLS But I I really like this RSL Good structure. luck Adrian. Yeah. Minnesota have two wins in their last seven. They go now to Atlanta to try to win the Open Cup. They are a picture of inconsistency throughout this year. They'll win four in a row, then they'll have a slide. They'll lose a couple, and then they'll bounce back. And we don't really know who they are. So it's hard to put them in that second spot and say, yeah, that's it. So in that way, I'm with you, Bobby. But uh, it's still open season so in the West. So did you pick a team? I haven't picked a team. Cool. No, I haven't picked a good, team. Good job. Stay strong. Yeah, I'm, Stay I'm strong. four of us, no, only two of us. Yeah, I, like if, if I had my to case pick a team, for RSL was me having to make yeah, a case. For sure. I'm not no, no, no. Yeah. Right. Look, if I had to pick a team, it would be the LA Galaxy. Yeah, no kidding. Based on the playoffs. No kidding. Based on the playoffs. Because it doesn't matter. None of these teams are going to win Jack in the regular season. Well, you already win? guaranteed the Galaxy would win. You're ex- you're, now, I, now I feel like I'm going to do it just to bring this thing full circle. The Galaxy in the playoffs, I think, are the best equipped of any of these teams. And that's just because it's 90 minutes and they got guys that in 90 minutes can somehow, some way, win okay, the game. Well, let me ask you this. Does Dallas factor into this at all if Andrasek keeps playing like he has the last two weeks? If the Cobra comes I, good? I've said for like nine weeks, and it's hard to say because they're, they've always been at the playoff line. But yeah. if you, if we said LAFC is the gold standard, the team that plays the closest soccer to LAFC is FC Dallas. Philadelphia. And, that's fine. Well, I'm looking at the Western Conference. Okay. I actually think that Philadelphia goes about what they do differently, right? With their rotations, how they break the lines, the movement, all those little things. But in the Western Conference, the team that plays the soccer, including aesthetically, including the way they dominate like 85% of the yardage on the field, 
is FC Dallas. And they did that against Houston, 5-1 right. winners. And it doesn't answer the question on if they're actually the second-best team, but I'm going to throw it out. Ask me at 8.15 p.m. Eastern time on September 22nd. Because they will have played Seattle and NYCFC in back-to-back games there. Yeah. I need to see that. I don't disagree with what Bobby's saying, but once again, when we go to games of consequence, that's what I need to see from this group. Um, and I think they have a really good schedule laid out for them where they can make the playoffs. So it'll be exciting to watch them in the playoffs, but I need to see them beat one or two good teams. Okay. Second best team in the East. Is it NYCFC? Every time we have this conversation. Didn't we just have this conversation last week yeah, I, or this week? I don't know. I can't yeah, remember. I've been talking I've second so best yeah, yeah, I don't think we're allowed to have this conversation. Okay, so I, I'm ready to talk at NYCFC. Do it. So just talk them generally. I've, oh, man, I've, I've struggled to distill my thoughts on them, and I think I've come around to this. Domi Trent has a view on how he wants to coach, right? It is. Did you guys hear the, the Jose Mourinho clip two weeks ago on Sky when he talked about your tactics can change, your principles of play do not? Yeah, I did. That you that. have to have general tenets of how you go about the game, staying compact, movements off the ball, your ideas going forward. And those are the first things you build in preseason. Everything else, the formation, the players, those can change. Domi Trent is in a similar field. The weird thing is that he came into a very well-constructed, very well-functioning NYCFC team under Patrick Vieira and changed that, right? He came in right away and started changing with the formation, started changing with the personnel, getting them to play and look a different way, which felt really weird. And I think for me as, as a person watching and a fan of what Patrick Vieira was doing, I found it jarring and unpalatable. I would call it, but he has come full circle. He tried to fix something that wasn't broken and rebuild it in his own way. He broke it and he fixed it. And I think it's fair to say it might be better than it was before. And it took me a long time to accept the fact that he broke something I really liked, but it's just as beautiful in the end. It's so it's, can I just say, I don't want to say it's just as beautiful because I still love yeah. the way that Patrick Vieira play, team played so much, but what Dome's done might end up being more dangerous functional. Yeah. Because it, it, it's it he can adjust like he can he, he's not a dog he's not dogmatic about trying to play through that Red Bulls press he's not going to lose four nil to a Red Bulls team so I think and we talked about it a lot right last year with his tinkering and changing and what he did I don't know that he understood what he came into was different than what he expected I think he thought Patrick Vieira was from Man City and City Football Group and he was going to come in and tinker with something that was already laid at a baseline that was what he was coming from. And I think once he got there and started to move things around, it came out that it wasn't the, – the, the principles weren't there. The base wasn't there that he thought existed. And then he started to play with things because that's how he wants to coach and that's how the team is now. I think over the course of the year, now he's embedded his principles and it gives him the options to change things. And he's talked about it like four or five times, how it doesn't matter what the formation is, how he can move guys in and out. He can play Matarita at left wing – center mid and left back in the same game but to him it doesn't matter it doesn't change the way the team's going to play and I think he came in expecting them to already be there based on what Vieira had done and it, that clearly wasn't true I just want to say I got in such a rut with second best teams I was talking best team in the east NYCFC yeah. 47 points just a yeah. point back I think that's what Bobby was talking about you're saying about. best second best team in MLS yeah I, I mean that's saying. that's always the conversation with LFC right now but mm-hmm. second best team Red Bulls maybe a little talent gap yeah. Show in this one? I mean, yes. I, I don't know <laughs> what else to. I was going to say how specifically Dome Trent set up, I thought was really cool. And maybe a blueprint for how to play Red Bulls. He played the old Red Bull 4 2 2 2 that they use under, was it Hazel Newt? We talked about the article in The Athletic yep. that Red Bulls used to use. Uh, Jesse used it a few times two years ago. But the idea is that you get numbers around the ball, both to build connections. They pass through the press. Andrew, we talked before the game. Yeah. I thought they were going to go direct. I thought they would. Yep. They had struggled the last two times they tried to build out of the back and got pressed. And they passed straight through Red Bull's press because they mixed it up a little bit. They played four center mids, Maxi Morales and Matriza in front of Keaton Parks and Alex Ring. It got numbers around the ball. But more importantly, they also won the second balls because when they did go forward and they did bypass lines in the air, they had numbers around it. It was a very smart game plan from Dome Trent to put extra numbers in the middle. All right, before we get to the Open Cup and, of course, Robin Frazier, I do want to talk Philly real quick, and I want to kind of figure out what you guys think the gauge for a successful season might be for this team. Right now, 48 points. They're in a playoff game. That's it? That's it. That's it. That's it. Host a playoff game and win it. And and that's a definitive step forward from last year, which was a definitive step forward from the year before. It's slow. It's steady. It's maybe not as spectacular as you're hoping. But, I, you know, until things 
change with the type of, I think, talent that, that Philly can either produce or bring in, um, I, don't, I don't think they're going to – like there's no Carlos Vela on the team except for the 15 minutes a game that El Senio can play. I wrote about Philadelphia – Last week, and we didn't get to talk about it here. I'm curious to hear your response. My general hypothesis is that, is that Atlanta changed the league because they brought in three Miguel, Miguel Almarone plus two other DPs. And they said, if you don't have someone at Miguel Almarone and or Joseph Martinez or Tito Vialba's level, you're donezo, right? Now here's LAFC. If you don't have someone with Carlos Vela, you're donezo. If you don't have Maxi Morales, this basically, I would say the $6 million incoming transfer player mm -hmm. then you don't have a chance to really compete long term maybe you've red bulls it for a year at philadelphia but over the long haul you just can't compete and ladero was that guy maybe for the sounders exactly. Ladero, and of course obviously Vale Trevinko and josie right. and, and michael and so the, the the hypothesis is that philadelphia and other clubs need to create this churn where they develop players and they might not have the capital investment right now to sign Miguel Marone. But you can, and the beautiful thing about this game is that you can make that capital investment. You can turn money over by transferring players out. So that the long-term goal of the Philadelphia Union is they might not plan to have Mark McKenzie, Brendan Aronson, Anthony Fontana, Austin Trusty to win right now. But if they turn those players, those three players, into a single Miguel Marone, and then they have the next group of players come through, the next Mark McKenzie and Austin Trusty, now you have three good homegrown players with Miguel Marone or Brian Fernandez or whoever you want to call it. So to answer the question, for me, it's a success for Philadelphia. In the long term, with the way MLS is going, if they can somehow turn these three young players into a Miguel Marone in the transfer market. Easier said than done. We will talk more about Canadian Classique on Thursday. We're just running out of time here, folks. We have to talk U.S. Open Cup preview. Orlando lose again to Atlanta United in Heineken Rivalry Week. Joseph Martinez, 12 straight games with a goal. Who else? He's doing his thing. Uh, look, but Orlando probably should have won that game. They were the better team. Doesn't matter. That's the kind of like record scratch of them over and over and over in this particular rivalry. Now Atlanta United has an opportunity for their second trophy of the year. You see that recovery there? Two trophies. You're learning. This Maybe is why we double. keep you on the team because you're yeah. coachable. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Atlanta, Minnesota, Tuesday, 8 p.m. Eastern for Mercedes-Benz Stadium. You can watch this thing on ESPN+. Plus. What are we going to see? Does Minnesota have a chance? Yes, Minnesota has a chance. Just plain and simple. If they, depending on the lineup Adrian Heath chooses to play, and you wrote about it, if Darwin Quintero probably doesn't start, and you more defensive and solid in central midfield, and you have a, a compact structure – and you make Atlanta, if they don't score in the first 20 minutes, and you make Atlanta slowly have to work for it and work for it, you have a chance to frustrate them. And I I might be biased because I was there for the semifinal, but if Mason Toy is on like that and can score the types of goals he can score and um, and score in individual moments, not needing a ton of buildup, yeah. then you have a chance. The problem is that his percentage chance of doing that is much lower than the percentage chance of – Joseph Martinez doing that. For sure. But I'll say this. Atlanta's going to play a high line. And Brad Guzan does not come off his line. Miles Robinson's phenomenal at recovering over the top. But that's still a margin for error there. What's this game hinge on? Doyle? Bobby? What would it be for you? What changes it? Who's the difference maker? What could Adrian Heath do? What might so, Frank DeBoer do? So one adjustment that Frank DeBoer made is that he pulled the reins off the conservative passing, right? One of the reasons we talked about pregame this weekend, one of the reasons you make conservative passes is you limit transition moments. Transition moments are the sport in 2019, right? If you're good at them or if you're bad at them, that can determine. He's loosened the reins. He's let Petey Martinez, Ezekiel Barco, Darlington Nagby, and all these guys make more threatening passes. If it doesn't come off, we have what we saw against Orlando where they just got destroyed in every single phase because or Orlando was organized in their counter pressing. They won the ball back and every single time Atlanta tried to move forward, they gave a bad pass away and Orlo Orlando came back down their throat. So it's finding this balance for them and being smart and not giving bad turnovers that lead to transitions, but also being yourselves. PD Martinez, and there's a great article by uh, on Dirty South Soccer today about how he's a guy that takes chances. You have to let him be that guy, but also be smart about it. Who needs this more, Doyle? Who, who will want it more? Who will value this Open Cup trophy more? I feel like Minnesota would value it more, but Atlanta needs it more. Because if you're Atlanta and you lose what, what's really one of the three or four major trophies um, at home, That's to Minnesota key. United in front of 60,000 fans or however many is going to be in that stadium, that's an embarrassment. So I, I feel like Minnesota would absolutely value it more, but it weirdly feels like there's much more on the line for Atlanta. Atlanta United, Minnesota United, U.S. Open Cup preview. It kills me, Dave, that we're not going to be there. 
Yeah. This was the, the be, tradition unlike any other. David, David, we've been in the in the mud since the first round of the Florida Soccer yeah. Soldiers, and Weeby's coming in <laughs> acting like he can go to the final. Yeah, what yeah. do you think this is? Classic. Yeah. You tell me Tell I, me the starting it's, striker. It's the MLS.com parachute, bro. I just come in at, no. the, at the best moment. Listen. I let you guys slog it out, grind it out, and then when it's, you know, the, the bright lights come on and Kevin Costner's walking around the stadium, I'm there to glad hand, baby. So you, you tell me the starting striker for the Orange County FC NPSL team, and we'll let you go to the Open Cup. Oh, wow. You're not going Is it either, Chris so. Cortez? No, no, but it's it's I'm an old it's a, don't even it's like an old open USL cup. guy. It's an old not, like chief of USA. Even, no, we're not playing this game with them. No. Don't even like we're open not playing cup. with. There's a line down the middle of this table. On one side, you guys. On the other side, people that should be at the Open Cup final. There was this, three months where Orbruch was leading the Golden Boot for the Open Cup. I just want that wow. to be out. Yeah, whoa. <laughs> Tuesday, PM. There's my chief of USA Plus. deep yeah. cut. All right, thank you. It's time to talk to Robin Frazier. He is the new head coach. Of the Colorado Rapids, he's on the line now from, uh, excuse me, from Denver. It's our AT&T call to the field. Robin, welcome to Extra Time. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So uh, last time we had you, I believe we sat in a conference room in Orlando, I think, and talked about the Colorado Foxes for about mm, close to an hour. We won't do that today, but people can go back and listen to it. You're now the head coach of the Rapids. Tell me about the decision to take this job. What went into it? Uh. I mean, there are a number of things. It's obviously uh, the thing about this group is that they are a young, talented group of players who really seem to be hardworking, and um, it just seemed like a good environment to to step in and be able to influence, as I said, a group that, that seems to really want to be coached. That's the player group you're going to work with. I want this from a personal side, man. I, w- I want to know what it means to you to be a head coach again, why this was the right situation, your thought process around it. Your name was linked a while ago. I thought this might have happened sooner. Yeah, for me, obviously, it's a great, it's a really a tremendous thing to be able to, from a personal standpoint, uh, there are a number of things being addressed here. One is I've spent more time in Denver, I think, than I have anywhere else as an adult. Uh, just over the years and various things. Um, so this is a place that I feel really comfortable, is really excited to have the opportunity to come back here. Um, professionally, I it, it's great to be a head coach again. Obviously, my first go around didn't go the way I wanted it to, uh, but I, it was it provided a, a real learning experience for me. And since then, to the other two teams that I've been an assistant coach for, again, have just continued to provide more and more learning experiences for me. And at a time when I feel like I'm ready, an opportunity came up, and the fact that it was in Denver just made it perfect. You mentioned being a head coach. You've done it once before. What are the biggest things that you feel like you can do differently or you want to change? Uh, I think part of it is choosing the right organization to be a part of. And uh, Colorado have a really, really good group of people behind the scenes, uh, the vision for the club, the desire to develop young players, um, it's, it's all something that's really appealing to me. Is there one specific part of the game that you experienced in Chivas and you've been waiting all these years to get another run at it as a manager? Uh, I think soccer-wise you're saying yes. specifically? Yes, soccer-wise, man management, whatever that detail is. Uh, probably both. I don't think that at Chivas, I don't think my attacking ideas were as clear as they needed to be. And given the the players we had, I don't think that I probably did enough to make that group more successful as an attacking group. Uh, having said that, I feel like my ideas have evolved a lot since then. And um, I'm excited excited to really put into into practice some things that I've just picked up along the way. Robin, you've obviously evolved since those Chivas USA days, but so has Major League Soccer. How has this league changed, and how will that force you to change a little bit? What have you seen at Red Bulls and Toronto FC? Um, how has the league changed? The league has changed. There, there's just more better players. There's more better players. There are uh, coaches that are more tactically astute. Um, those are the big differences that you see. The when I say more better players, the American players are getting better and better as well. I think that there's been a a real shift in coaching in the last probably four or five years, whereas you see American players are more prepared now at younger ages than they've been. And then obviously with the influx of money since uh, 2011, 
it's, the league has just been able to bring in more better players. So I think uh, the standards are higher, the expectations are higher, um, and it's just again you say, what have I learned along the way? These are things I've learned along the way and how to how to cope and and thrive in that environment. When you step into the Rapids, do you have an idea of the way you want to play, or are you going to adjust based on the players at your disposal? Is that question for this week Saturday, or is that question long term, long haul, long term, long term? Definitely, have an idea if I want to play. Uh, no question. Um, this isn't. I, I ask that question kind of tongue in cheek because obviously, if you have a preseason, you have time to establish how you want to play, but. When you have five days with a new group to establish how you want to play, it's a lot about building on what they're already doing and not making great changes in this time period. So take me to that preseason maybe next year, and I know this is theoretical, but everybody wants to hear this. Rapids fans, MLS fans, what is that way? How do you see the game, Robin? Help us understand. For me, I've always seen the game in terms of numbers and manipulation of numbers and being able to control games through good possession, uh, but also set up attacks through good possession, being able to possess in one area specifically to attack another area. Uh, and it all starts from the decisions of the first pass of the, of the sequence of passes that lead to an attack. It's all about setting that up and then how you're able to go from there. Uh, good positional play is a big part of it in terms of setting up the numerical advantages that you want where you want them. And then it's about executing once you get into areas where you have a numerical situation that's favorable and how quickly can you execute it and the things that go into that execution. Take us into the rest of this year, but also going for the future. What about this group that the Colorado Rapids currently have gets you excited? Who are you excited to work with? There are quite a few players that I've, as I've watched the team more and more that I'm I think are some really interesting players. I, I like the fact that we have wingers that can beat people. Uh, as you look around the league, there aren't that many teams that have players that can beat people in wide positions. Uh, I think that that's uh, a game changer in terms of what you're able to do or not able to do as a coach or as a team. So with, uh, with some of the wide players I have, I think that, that that's really interesting. I think um, Kellen Acosta for me is a, a young player with tons of ability and a, a huge engine. Um, he's a player that I'm, uh, I find also very interesting. Uh, there, really, there are quite a few. I could, I could go down the list, but those are the ones that come to mind. I think about uh, Kai Kamara, who's been doing what he's been doing for so many years, and he's still a handful, and he's still able to get three, four chances a game uh, just through good movement and being really a tremendous athlete. So, Robin, I mean, I think everybody can see where the Rapids have been in the standings over the last couple of years. It's not where they wanted to be at all. And it feels like to me that this era of MLS is one where maybe you can't just grind it out and expect to be right there in the playoff contention. You have to have talent. You have to have something more. You have to have a competitive edge. What would that competitive edge in your mind be for the Rapids? I think the competitive edge for this team going forward is going to be their ability to play as a team and really good understanding of, of what the objectives are offensively and defensively. And when you put good players in predictable good positions for each other, then you're able to create chances, you're able to score goals. Uh, defensively, you're able to move well as a unit and be difficult to penetrate. So uh, players are important, and I know that there are some DP slots open. I also know you have some experience over the last couple of years working with designated players, very successful designated players. What did you learn about that selection process and what kind of players you and Pork Smith might collaborate on to go after? What have I learned about the selection process? Yeah, what works? Like every single time, every single time you acquire a player, uh, you learn something. Some of it good, some of it not so good. But I do think that it takes a lot of uh, background check, uh, lots of inquiries about the players, uh, what they're like Monday through Friday, just not just what you see on Saturday, what their character is like. Uh, these are all important things when acquiring players. When you, you don't have, I mean, this isn't Man City. We're not just going to drop a $100 million player to put another $100 million player, player in. So it's important that in the selection process that you're pretty thorough and you know the type of character 
that you're getting and that that character knows the situation that they're getting into. I think uh, the more clarity you can provide both ways, the better chance you have of making a long-term uh, situation stick. Robin, I know this is an exciting move for you. I assume one of the things you're most excited about is after years of you not having to talk to me because you were the assistant coach, now you get to spend all this time talking to us. You know, I actually put that in the contract. That's one of the reasons I took the job. <laughs> what, it was required that you talk to us? You wanted to talk to us? That's what you're saying? Part of the contract is you demand appearances on extra time? Absolutely. And see, this is appearance number one. So, so that's one down and I don't know. 10 or 12 to go in the next couple Ooh, of weeks. We're going to keep yeah. that written down. we got to get a copy of this contract. All right, Robin, thank you so much for joining us. Good luck with everything. We'll be watching this work this year and, of course, the offseason and going forward. All right, great. Thanks, guys. Big thanks to Robin Frazier. Clearly, he adores. He loves to be on extra time. Media is going to be the number one highlight of. He's his always team. asking to talk to me. He's <laughs> like, "Hey, appreciate it, Robin. You know, I got all this time. Gotcha. Do you want to just chat? You know, yeah. about anything, whatever yeah. you want, Dave. Yeah. Cool. All right. So, what are your reactions, Robin Frazier? Rapids. The big reaction was he he like volunteered that his philosophy uh, with regards to the attacking part of the game has evolved a ton over the course of this decade, which is music to my ears because Robin Frazier has been a good assistant coach for a long time, but I remember those Chivas teams and those were uh, those were unwatchable attacking teams. So hearing that he, he's evolved some and he has different ideas uh, for how he wants his team to play going forward, you know, he kind of tipped his hand a little bit talking about how they have so many wingers who are good 1v1. I wonder if that's maybe what they'll look like, Some kind of like San Jose where you spread it out. Um, I, I'm excited. I, I hope, you know, it, it's it's frankly nice to see a, a black American head coach in the league again. Um, it's, I'm happy for Robin Frazier, who's regarded as one of the, the truly good guys in the league, and uh, he was a great defender in his day. Yeah, he was. He has another chance after Chivas USA, Robin Frazier, head coach of the Colorado Rapids. Short term's one thing, long term's another, because they have some open DP slots, and they have some room to work with to try to plot the plot, the, the, you know, plot it forward for him. I was going to hit a hard transition there. Oh, yeah? Going to the mailbag. Speaking of great defenders, whoa, whoa. Woo. the Toronto Duck wants to know who are your top 10 center backs in MLS. 10 is a very large number. Let's say top three. Where do we want to start? I'll let, I'll I, let I can, I can start. start. Yeah. I, I put together my list. So I really struggle to know who in a pairing is better because I saw plenty of times when you feel like there's a very good player and then the other guy sits out and he's not nearly as good. So I'm going to say the two names who I feel confident individually are – they are the better one in the pairing. And that's Ike Opara and Larice Maviala. That they are the two where I say they're the superior one in that, and they're both in the top 10. They're both 1As right now. The other pairings, the other elite pairings for me are Walker Zerman, Eddie Segura, Robin Janssen and Lamine Sané have both been good this year, Hedges and Ziegler. The questionable one that I have, and I don't know which grouping to put him in, is Matt Beasler, and the one that I'm going to toss to Matt on because he disagrees. But for me, it's the pairing LGP and Miles Robinson, I would still personally take LGP. If I had one pick, I would rather have LGP in my team. Partially that style, he's still a little bit of a passer. Um, but those are my elite pairings. Plus you did the, not mention so Tim did Parker and Aaron Long. No, right? I'm doing current form right now. Oh, okay. And the bottom line is, like you guys know I love Tim Parker and Aaron Long. Their current form does not put him on this okay. list. I agree with that. I, I, he didn't mention uh, Collins and Chanel, who have been really, really so good this year. Well. I, actually, I put that off because I didn't. Know, I, I, I don't know where I rank them. Yeah. So I it's, put them off and tough. just got them back on. I don't think there's one standout group this year other than Segura and, and Zimmerman. And part of it is that they're both really good individually, and part of it is that they complement each other so well, and part of it is that they are part of this beautiful machine. Um, I disagree with you about LGP and Robinson because you could put Robinson into any back line and he's going to be fine um, and you can have him play any style clearly and he's going to be fine and Frank DeBoer has talked about this how much better of a passer and an initiator for the offense he's been and he showed that in Andrew's favorite game ever Campione's Cup when he literally I mean he was striding into midfield like Beckenbauer and creating chances with the ball on his foot um, LGP needs a guy who can put out fires next to him it has to be either a Parkers who just reads the game or Robinson, who is just off the charts in every facet, he can control like 
can control for the mistakes that LGP invariably makes. All right. Uh, it's Lawless Abu Bakr. I want to throw that. He's, he's, he's been really good. If you were talking about up and coming, he should def- be in the next yeah. year. <laughs> and Wait, just, and honestly, way. Justin Glad deserves a yeah. shout out as well. I just want to say that there is a cough button or a sneeze button for it wouldn't you there, matter. Dave. It wouldn't matter. Yeah, I'm glad that you turned toward me when you did that. That yeah. was really and cool. Did we mention Ike Opara? Ike Opara yeah, might Ike be Parra. the right but answer. Where, well, is where is Calvo on the list? Stop. Stop. Uh, Matt he got Red- that goal, though. But Hold Matt, on. Well, let's close out on this. Matt at Red Bull Arena wants to say, given reverse fortunes of SKC in Minnesota, should we rename the Chad Marshall theorem the Ike Opara theorem? No. It's the Chad Marshall theorem. Get it, Ike. I, I think there's a place in the MLS conversation about where that ranks in roughest or most one-sided trades of all time. We will have that conversation maybe next time around. One thing I do want to add here, uh, you will have seen this. You will have heard about it this weekend. The Sounders and the Timbers, they can't agree on something. They came together before the match to exchange special pennants, um, basically saying, hey, look, each emblazoned, anti-racism, anti-fascism, we all stand in that front as well. Uh, You may have also noticed that the atmosphere was a little quieter. So you've seen the coverage out there. You can read about it. The first 33 minutes of the match, segments of support on both sides stayed silent. It was a protest of league policy regarding political signage in stadiums, in particular the iron front symbol. So if you want to read more, I'm sure you can figure out how to do that. In the meantime, thank you to Robin Frazier for joining us. Thank you to you guys for getting the old gang back together. Felt like old times, but, you know, Kaylin and Susanna, they can still be a part of the crew. We will see you on Thursday, everybody. Have a great week. Oh, Charlie, Charlie, I'm so sorry. We'll be